super great. Um, so we are live in the studio and um, yeah, a big welcome to everyone that is streaming live, that is um, um, connected to this conference, K2F 2030. Um, so my name is Adebayo. I'm the head of research and chief learning designer at EasyDG. Um, EasyDG is a research and training based organization on educational technology and 21st century learning systems. And then um, this is one of the things we do from time to time um, because we believe that um, we live in a global village and um, education is evolving as a rate that should be known everywhere in Africa, across every continent, right? Um, if you're connected live or you are able to view um, at your convenience synchronously, I'd like to say a big welcome to this conference. Um, thank you for finding out time to join us in this conference and I can assure you that this is going to be a great time. It's going to be a great experience, right? Um, uh, we have a great line of, um, of speakers or facilitators um, who are going to be um, handling um, a number of sessions today um, and it promises to be a great time. Um, so I'm just going to speak briefly. about it. In the next few minutes, I will uh, bring the first speaker on. Right. Change uh, from a system that is responsible for preparing kids for examinations, you know, getting them set just to pass it. that is right um today our world is volatile is uncertain is complex and ambiguous ambiguous um we need these kids in the k-12 system to begin to have right the skills the knowledge and um, the competencies they need to thrive in this kind of world which is why the purpose of k-12 has to be redefined this is why right now we have um, a K-12 that is rather focused on empowering kids, right, to develop and build in-demand and relevant skills, right, knowledge and competencies that allows them to thrive in their own future, right? So when we're talking about their own future, every child in year eight, from year eight to year 11, or thereabouts, today is going to be in the global uh, workforce um, by 2030 right that's something to think about so we are thinking about the future and more you think about the future the more your steps in the present is guided the more you are guided in the present to make the right steps right we see what the future is saying right many research bodies are coming up with several reports talking about what um is going to happen in this age. this this decade is really a decade of disruption right from 2020 so many things have unfolded in such a very fast manner and um, it is only telling us again that we have entered a decade that's going to be filled with so much of disruptions across every walk of life, right? And what is the K-12 system doing because of this? What is the K-12 doing to address this issue, right? And that's summarily what this conference is all about. So we have a number of topics that we're going to be considering um, as regards how you as a school owner, as a school leader, as an educator can build um, a, a K-12 a model right that prepares your kids for the society and economy of 2030 right this is a future forward conference and a future oriented conference and everything you're going to be seeing here are practical things that you can start working you can start running with in your various schools your various learning institutions so once again i'd like to say a big thank you thank you for joining us in this conference uh, my name is adebay once again and um i'm your host right so quick one um we are going to move into the first um, session for today. Um, please get seated. We are about to we're about to embark on a mental flight. Right? I call it a mental flight because we're going to take you somewhere so wide, and then um, I can only wish you a sick journey. <laughs> right? So get your pen, get everything set, and um, of course, um, you're watching live from YouTube. Please feel free um, share your thoughts. We want to hear from you. 
um, feel free to ask questions. We're on YouTube to take your questions and to also get your thoughts, you know, um, as you connect with this conference. All right. Um, so I'm going to be bringing up the first speaker and then we're going, to, we're going to be looking at how to design learning experiences that produce real innovators and problem solvers. Right. This is one thing that K-12 must be all about today. Right. Globally, that is where it stands. Where it stands is that K-12 has now become a system that is responsible for producing real problem solvers. It's no longer just about paper problems and simple problems, right? It has gotten to a level of dealing with complex problems. Right now, K-12 is addressing complex problems, raising real innovators. We are seeing kids doing amazing things all over the world. How do you create learning experiences that will produce real innovators and problem solvers in your school? That's what this session is all about. And to take us in this session um, is Kyle Wagner, right, from Transform Educational Consulting Limited um, from Hong Kong, right? And I'm um, quick one. I'm going to bring Kyle in. Can you hear me? Yeah. Very well. Very well. Super. Kyle, I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you real time. I can hear you real well. Um, so, Kyle, we're, we're so excited to have you in this conference. I remember the last time we had you around was during PBL Festival. That experience. Took us through some onto PBL and what it looks like. Such an amazing one. And again, we are so excited to have you here again in K to 12 2030. And um, um, Kyle, can I can I confirm one second that you're ready for us? Are you ready? I'm ready. Super, super, super. So when you see Kyle standing before the camera, you really can know that Kyle is ready for us today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super excited. So Kyle is a project business um, um, expert and um, uh, practitioner um, who has, um, through Transform Educational Consulting, Consul Consulting Limited, has helped a number of schools across the globe um, to um, embrace project based learning in different ways. And um, we're excited. For the sake of time, um, we started a bit late. Um, but of course, you're still going to hear more about Kyle, right? But I need to just let Kyle take the stage right now. All right, Kyle, once again, um, we're so glad. Thank you for joining this conference. Thank you for sharing your time um, with us. And I'm just going to step down and hand over the stage to you. Over to you, Kyle. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Adrian Bio, for welcoming me. Um, he said that I was in Hong Kong. The uh, sun would not be shining so bright right now if I was in Hong Kong. I'm actually tuning in from San Diego, California, where I'm visiting some family. And I wanted to start this presentation uh, not by sharing, you know, myself and what I do in my background, but really wanting to hear from all of you. And as we start to think of how to design real world meaningful learning experiences, I don't want to start necessarily from a school lens, because oftentimes when we try to do things from a school lens, they don't feel natural. But problem solving is quite natural. And I want to start out with a question for each of you. What was your most memorable learning experience okay and this this question i want you to picture uh, a learning experience that you've had and preferably one that has been outside of school that you have enjoyed that is stand out in your memory and as i share one of my most memorable learning experiences use that as a spark for you to think about what was something meaningful that you remember and preferably hopefully from your childhood so that's a question I want to pose to you. And I want to share a bit of my most meaningful learning experience. And it started in Gulu, Uganda. And Gulu, Uganda was a far, far cry from where I was at in San Diego, California. And the reason I was going to Gulu, Uganda was not one um, that was, you know, excitable for most people to go to Gulu, Uganda. I had no idea of what to expect. But the reason why I was there was because of a, a war that had broken out um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It also included the region of Uganda. And the focus of the story is going to be hopeful and positive, but it didn't start out hopeful and positive. What you see pictured there are students, actually kids, as young as nine and 10 years old, who were forced to fight um, in an army uh, to rebel against the government. They were taken, they were abducted into the bush and forced to fight. And imagine now, some of you probably are parents, and to think of a nine or 10 year old, your nine or 10 year old, not going to school, but instead being forced to fight. 
And so I was over there because I was part of this organization called Invisible Children. And the hope was to help to reschool some of these orphans because the war fortunately had uh, moved um, outside of Uganda. But as a result, there were a lot of students and a lot of kids who because of that war had become orphans. And this is me here at one of those um, makeshift schools. Because I want us to think in terms of schools, not necessarily as a building that we are typically familiar with, because school is just a place of learning. And this is where I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to um, take part in an exchange program. This is me in the back of the classroom, learning a little bit from the methodologies of the teachers there in Gulu. And then I had an opportunity to work with these students in helping them to learn English. But the point of this is not to share my teaching experience because my, my teaching experience was quite rich. As I mentioned uh, to us all before, when it comes to learning experiences, for us to really try to think of a learning experience that happened outside of school. Um, Adebayo, just really quick on, are you guys seeing what I'm seeing on my screen? I have a picture of a chalkboard at the front. Is that something you guys are seeing or are you not seeing that? Yeah, so yes, we are. Yes, we are. I, I see the slide. Yeah. Yes, we are. Okay. Okay, so you see the chalkboard in the front. Okay, I just want to make sure because I'm seeing something different on my phone. So again, the, the point is not necessarily to share about my teaching experience because, you know, these students are like any students from any school. Yes, they had an interesting background and, you know, they were displaced. But they had the opportunity, they had the desire to learn just like any other students. And so this is one of the classes I was teaching in. But first, what I wanted to do is just really get a background, understand kind of who they were, where they were coming from. This is me eating some of the, uh, the, the famed meals that they would have at lunch. Everybody uh, went around and, and had a communal meal together. And they ate with their hands, which I love because I myself am, uh, you know, a, a very kind of, uh, take take the food from your hands and, and put it in your mouth. Um, I come from a large family as well. And so I was getting to know the students. But again, I, I wanted to share a learning experience for me that didn't happen within school. Um, and it started by seeing one of the areas at this, um, this school for these orphans was full of these books. And as you can see here from the picture, um, these books weren't organized. Uh, these books were all in, in different piles. And as I went into uh, this space and I talked with the person you see with his um, hand on his head there, I asked, you know, where are these books coming from? They said, well, you know, we get a lot of donations. We get a lot of books from all over the world. And, you know, this is where they come. And I asked, well, you know, do the students come to visit this area? Are they reading these books? And he says, no. And, you know, I, I dug in a little bit longer and I said, you know, do we, do we want the students to be coming by here? Is the hope uh, that they would look, use the library? And maybe it can, you know, be a great resource for the school. And he said, yes, but, the, you know, the problem is we have a lot of books and we, you know, we don't really have the means uh, to build out the library. And I said, you know, would you mind if, you know, we work together on this big question? How can beautifying this unused library increase usership and help more students to fall in love with learning English? And he said, sure. You know, at this, uh, this point, you could take any help that he, he could get. And so this was the start of a project. This was a start of a learning experience that stands out really for me, even beyond um, traveling to Gulu, Uganda and hearing the stories of these displaced orphans and working within the classrooms. This project was more meaningful for me. And one of the first things that we had to do was find out, well, how are we gonna build out you know, the library? How are we gonna organize these books? So I got the other teachers who had come um, from the states together. We also got some of the local teachers and asked them, is, you know, is there a, a place that, that uh, we could build out some, some shelves or we can actually build out some cabinets for the library? And he said, yes, there's a you know, local craftsman up the sweat up there. As you can see, this is the picture here. And um, I, you know, I went inside. This yeah. Hi, sure. Kyle. Hi. Yes. Hi, Kyle. Can, yeah. you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, what I see, so what I see on your screen is the first slide, slide number one. I just wanted to confirm that that's where you are. Is that where you are? Oh, is it still on the first slide? 
Okay, still on the first slide. No, no, it's not on the first slide. I've advanced through about like a, a lot of slides. Let, let me let me make sure. Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, let's try this again. Let me see if I could share the share it with a, a, a different. Apologize okay. for that. I've been through about seven, seven or seven or eight slides. So let's make sure. Okay, it's fine. Sharing this. Uh, okay, I think I, I think what I need to do. Let me stop sharing this for a second. We're gonna have to start this over. I apologize. I think we'll have to share the entire screen and see if this works. Can you see what I'm sharing here? Super. Okay, I'm gonna add it to the stream now. Okay. Now you see it. Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. I apologize. I apologize yeah. to everybody. <laughs> we might. So, so we'll start where we left off. Okay. So this, this is obviously a learning experience in and of itself. So I went through these different slides. Um, let me show you again. Um, so this is, you know, where I travel to in Uganda. And again, uh, the reason that I was there and the reason a lot of teachers were there um, was to exchange knowledge, exchange learning. Um, and help support the, the schools that were there because an unfortunate thing had happened. Um, you know, students as young as nine, as young as 10 years old, um, were recruited to fight in this resistance army. And that had left obviously a huge impact um, on the country. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of these, these kids had lost their parents in this fighting. And so we were there to help kind of work with these schools um, this is a makeshift school that you see that was put up in uh, Gulu, Uganda. And uh, this is me in the back of the classroom um, waiting to teach. And we were there to, to teach English, but more importantly, to really exchange best practice when it came to uh, teaching and learning. And as you know, I mentioned uh, to you earlier, when you think about your most meaningful learning experience or your most meaningful project, it's easy for us as teachers to think of a project we might have led in school. But I want us to think outside of that lens and think perhaps of a project that you led that was meaningful, that was outside of school. Because my project didn't necessarily take place inside of the classrooms. And these are some of the classrooms that you see here. Here's me teaching in those classrooms. Students were super attentive. Um, they, they wanted to know all about uh, the states. They called me Bazungu, which is a foreigner. Um, so, you know, they were great. They taught me a little bit of their culture. Here's me eating one of the meals. Um, all the meals were quite communal um, that we eat at lunch. And here's, you know, me eating with my hands. Um, here's some of the students uh, that wanted to form connections and learn all uh, about the states and about the West. Um, but again, my project was a project that started outside of the classroom. And that was the library project. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this was a space in the school. It was a very small, um, again, like a very makeshift uh, library that was put up with uh, bamboo and it was put up with a straw roof. And inside of that, this is what uh, it looked like. It was you know, filled with different stacks of books. Obviously the books weren't organized. And as you can see there, the person who was managing the library kind of has his head down. He's reading books, he's quite interested but the students weren't really coming to the space and it was very underutilized. And so right away in any kind of project or learning experience, the best learning experiences are gonna start with a key provocation or a key problem. And our question became, well, how can beautifying the unused library help increase usership and help more students to fall in love with learning English? Because really that was the hope and all these books had been donated from all places around the world but the problem is they were being underutilized. And so that set off the learning process. So some of the, the teachers and I, we got together, some of the local teachers, some of the foreign teachers, and one of the very first questions we had to answer was, you know, who can build these shelves, who can build the cabinet so that we can start to design the library. So we found local craftsmen, and um, this is the, the building where those local craftsmen were located. Uh, we went inside, um, asked them, hey, are, are you able to do, do some work? And they said, sure. And they gave us a price. They quoted us on a price. And 
you know, we, we raised the funds uh, between all the, the teachers, the foreign teachers that were there, and we were able to pay them. They came to the school and, you know, they started to assemble those shelves and measured it out and really, really took the time, built these by hand. And within one week, we had our shelves. We had um, some help from some other teachers. This is one of the teachers here that is organizing all of these books. And within a week's time, once the shelves were up, we started inviting the students. And because now the library was transformed, it was no longer a place just full of stacks of books. It became a place for learning. And these are some of the students here who are expressing their gratitude. They're doing a local um, culture song and dance. The name of the group of people were the Acholi, um, which obviously there are many tribes here in, in Gulu, Uganda. And uh, so this was a, a commemoration of this project, also a comm commemoration of the exchange of knowledge and ex uh, exchange of teaching practices. So I'm sharing that because when we think of our most meaningful projects or most meaningful learning experiences, there's a difference between a project that we design in school and a project that we take part in outside of school. And one of the first questions I asked was what was your most meaningful uh, learning experience or most meaningful project that you remember? So in the chat window, if you could just quickly write, what was your most meaningful project? It could have been writing a book, it could have been building a garden, building an extension of your home. Um, it could be starting a business. It could be creating a website. What was your most meaningful project? So I'm looking in the chat window here and want to get just a couple people to give their input on what their most meaningful project was. So we'll give just a few seconds for you to write in the chat window. What is a project that you took part in that you really remember that was meaningful for you? Great. And as you are thinking of what that most meaningful project is, because I'm looking here in the chat window, I don't see those. Um, I want to talk about a key difference between the way projects look in school and the way projects look like in real life. And what if instead of um, a project happening typically at the end of our learning experiences, I think back to my schooling experience and I remember quite vividly a project where we learned about medieval Europe. And at the end of learning about um, all the different uh, periods of history, we learned about the castles, we learned about the different wars, we learned a little bit about daily life. Um, the teacher said, okay, now it's time to go home and you're gonna have two days and you're gonna create a project uh, around medieval Europe and you're gonna make a castle. That was our project. And it was very fun. And I remember we learned about medieval Europe for eight weeks. And then again, the teacher said, okay, go home, take a, a day or two and build a castle. Now, it was quite fun for us. We spent those two days building the castle, but we really didn't have time to give feedback to each other. We didn't really have time to think about how we might want to present our castles um, when it came to getting the materials, when it came to actually the construction of the castles themselves and making sure that, that it, it mirrored uh, the way castles were designed in medieval Europe. And that's typically what projects look like in school. But the learning experience that I just shared with you about the library, what if we could have projects and projects could drive the learning? What if instead of the project being pulled by the learning and the project is only a way to share our learning at the end of an experience, what if we started with the project and the project act as a lead? And there's a question that drove students to producing their own outcomes and the learning that you see taking place here happened as a result of that project. And instead of now having eight weeks of learning and then a project to solidify it, we actually had the learning happen all eight weeks through the project. And that's you know, what I'm here to share with you is that really, it's actually quite simple to design a learning experience like that. And it, it's predicated on three simple design principles. 
These same three principles um, have been used to help teachers from K through 12 uh, design learning experiences ranging from creating their own businesses um, to students taking on meaningful uh, community stories um, from their communities they lived and sharing those. These are the same three principles that have allowed um, students to work with scientists and take part in real investigations um, to create documentary films. And these same three design principles are ones that you can use from wherever you're tuning in from in the world to design your own learning experiences. And before I share what those three principles are, again, uh, my name is Kyle Wagner. My simple credo is helping forward thinking schools to develop socially, emotionally, globally aware citizens and primarily doing that through project learning based learning. I have my start at High Tech High, which some of you might know of from the film Most Likely to Succeed. And um, I, I've now had the great honor and privilege um, of helping teachers all across the world design those experiences and see the impact and transformation that it has on students. So I started from outside and looking at a project from outside school. And I think that's important for us to think about the way projects run so that we can start to think of how to design those within school. So um, without further ado, imagine, imagine instead of starting learning experiences inside of our silos, inside of our little offices or with our curriculum or textbooks as a guide, what if we started our learning experiences through having students tackle a meaningful problem? Because as we know, there are many problems that exist and there are many opportunities for students to be able to devise their own unique solutions to those problems. So I want us to start, not necessarily with our textbook or our curriculum or what we have to teach, and thinking about our own communities. What challenges, what opportunities exist in our own communities? That's the starting point. And from that starting point, there should be a question that is originated. In this particular case, this is at the International School of Beijing. Uh, this was um, a waterway that was very close to the school. Um, these students are uh, from their expat students and right next to this waterway was their apartment. And the question became, as you can tell, it, it looks quite polluted, right? So any kind of problem might be simple to, uh, to, to understand or to observe. The complexity comes in the actual learning that needs to take place to solve that problem. And so a question is generally born out of a problem. And specifically, that question as you're writing it, or as you're creating that question, think about what kind of curriculum can be included. So for example, this question was, how do we use data to make a positive impact on a local waterway? And after you have that question, what if instead of planning in your silo, just amongst your own subject, whether that's math, whether that's science, um, whether it's humanities, whether that's language, what if you got together with other teachers and you looked at that key question or that key problem and determined, well, what kind of content and skills are they gonna need in our subjects to address that particular problem or challenge? Now is the time that you can open up your curriculum. And in looking at this water quality project, what might students need to know in science, in humanities, in math and language to solve this problem? Now, again, I did say this is going to be partly interactive. I'm looking at the chat window and perhaps I'm not looking at the right chat window, but I'm looking now and I don't see any messages uh, so far. So I, I want to ask, think of your, your lens of your subject. If you were delivering this project, how do we use data to make a positive impact on a local waterway? What might they need to know in terms of your subject? And so, for example, you might look at science and say that they need to understand the different components uh, of for water testing. You might say they need to know about dissolved oxygen um, and nitrogen levels. So what might they need to know to answer this question? So in the chat window, if you feel so inclined to share and participate, that would be great. So we can honor some of the contributions that you make.
Yeah, so Kyle, um, so from the first question you asked, um, we had a number of um, projects um, being shared. Um, we have I think about like um, three projects there, but um, the first one from um, Miss Evelyn from USA, she said, um, I loved my ninth grade literature teacher coming out of my shell and acting in um, theatrical production. Um, so some when you catch you from Nigeria talked about making a dress. And um, again, Miss Evelyn said as an adult, creating my own school is my most meaningful project. <laughs> yeah. And so we have RK from Singapore saying, um, getting students to perform and entertain senior citizens at a senior citizen home. The students oh, were great. intellectually challenged. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, so yeah, those are the projects that were mentioned in the chat box. Okay, excellent. Now, normally what I would do here is, you know, ask them to share a little bit more about those projects, but thank you for sharing those. You know, a, a theatrical production is a great example of project-based learning because to put on a performance, as we all know, there's the scripts that need to be written. There's the actors that need to get together. Um, oftentimes too, there's uh, the filming of the performance itself. And so there's, you know, positions that have to be filled for those things. Um, there's actually, you know, the content um, of the, the script itself. So all of these components, thank you for sharing that, are, are natural as part of the project. This person who just mentioned the, the senior citizens, right, at that home, what a great project because these are real people um, that you're affecting and, you know, having students be able to serve those people is going to be much more meaningful for them. This project that was shared about the dress, you know, what a great example as well. I, and what I would ask that person is, you know, were you a seamstress? Um, did you know how to sew? Because my, um, I have a friend who had to learn how to sew um, because, you know, there was a lot of fabric that was left over from her grandma and her grandma passed away and she wanted to pass that on to um, the younger generations and her own daughter. So she, you know, learned to sew, took up sewing and uh, stitched those things together and made quilts and made dresses. So the engagement, the empowerment is there naturally when there's a project that is going to drive us. So thank you for sharing that input. Um, Adebayo, do you see anyone who left comments as to what um, this question here, what kind of content would students need to answer? Uh, this question about water quality did people um, um not yet once i get that one i'll let you know okay great thank you um at any rate uh we can think of you know the science that they have to cover they'd have to understand a little bit about water quality um ecosystems um learning about those interdependencies when it comes to to water testing um humanities uh, we're also thinking uh, in terms of the geography of the area and how that impacts people. Um, also in terms of, you know, cultural values, uh, the government and policies and how policies are set. If they're going to influence policy to help improve a waterway, well, they should probably know how the local government, um, you know, acts. When it comes to math, uh, if we think of the actual data collection that they did, the qualitative, the quantitative data that they had to collect to answer this uh, question, um, they were, you know, gathering trash from the waterway and trying to find out um, where that came from. So, so there's math involved in that as well. And there's also complex math formulas when it comes to uh, testing for dissolved oxygen levels and these other things in water quality. Now, when it comes to language, you know, they're going to have to use language to put together the proposal for whatever their innovation is going to be. But what I want to stress to us is that actually learning experience design is quite simple when you are tackling it from a real problem because one question will naturally lead to the next and it doesn't have to feel like something that's forced that we're just teaching for our standards or curriculum we're actually teaching to help students solve real problems so um you know what if to solve those problems and to understand a little bit more about the complexities of the issue students heard from experts this is a local ngo that came to speak to our students um, about the, the whole water scarcity issue in Beijing. And, you know, students were able to work uh, very closely with this NGO in terms of the projects that they um, had devised to answer that question. They conducted real investigations. So here is them um, taking water samples. They're seeing how 
effects of certain natural processes can help filter water quality. This is there at a local wetland and using their equipment. So some of us might think, well, then how do you know, what if we don't have this equipment or these means available to us? Well, there's a lot of community partners that we can use that do have the, that equipment available to them. And so here's uh, students testing the water samples and using the advanced equipment to understand um, how to test for those various components and what that says about the water quality. What if we also had students act as real scientists? So this is them working with a local school and they're, they're going a little bit deeper into the water quality testing before they make their conclusions. Now, as a byproduct of this as well, you know, these students are, are expat students and they're working with a local Chinese school. As a byproduct of this project, students are naturally exchanging language. And that is the great part about projects. You know, projects do have a scope, but where kids can take that is oftentimes far beyond any kind of learning experience that we can design that is only, um, is only uh, uh, con contrived and, and, and contained within our classrooms. Now, what if also we had students share their findings with real experts? You know, what if we could get parents who had expertise in this particular issue and students could present their ideas and get feedback on those ideas from a panel in the same way that when people do research and development and you're, if you're doing research and development for university and you have to present your findings to get your funding and to keep your funding, what if students had the same onus um, when they were going through a learning experience themselves? And that's what we did. You know, we had students be able to present. They got specific feedback on their proposals. Once they got that specific feedback, they started to devise real solutions. Now, oftentimes we think of projects as all students doing the same thing. Think back to the project I shared with you of building that castle. We all built a castle. Yes, some students had some choice as to which castles they built, but we're all building castles. But once we open it up and we're having students solve real problems, we're having them think of their own solutions based on the research and the investigations that they conduct. So this student here that you see on the left, she decided to upcycle um, old clothing and uh, get students to bring in that, that clothing, upcycle it and use those as renewable bags. Now she took it a step further. She went to the local grocery store and said, you know, we've created all these different bags. Can we use these bags in your grocery store? Because we notice a lot of this plastic is going into the local waterway. And the supermarket says yes. And in fact, not only will we use these bags, anyone who purchases these bags will get a discount on their groceries. So this, these projects are not just confined to a quick product that students produce. These live well beyond the classroom. Now this student here is, these, it is devising a solar water filter and the reason he's devising that solar water, water filter was not just because he thought of this and he just, you know, Googled how can we solve the water quality issue. It's because, you know, he had a conversation with a local villager. Um, these are the students here. They're talking to this uh, local villager and investigating a little bit as to what are the issues that they face. This particular villager shared that actually the water quality used to be quite good. Um, and since a lot of industry has moved into the area, the water quality has changed. And he thought of a solution that was actually going to be relevant to her. And that's why, you know, he was devising this solar water, water filter. So when we think about a project, think about the potential. If students are just completing a project where they're building a castle and all the students are building a castle, they build the castle. And I'll tell you what happened with my castle, along with everybody else's castle. They put their suit and tie on, they shared the castle, they were proud. But generally what happened in that castle is it ended up either in the garbage bin out back or maybe in a closet somewhere. But it's not something that lasts, that has permanence. These solutions, when you're really having students tackle real problems, they live on well beyond the project due date. And what, what if also students could exhibit for a real, community audience. And instead of, you know, putting on their suit and tie, as I mentioned, and presenting for a teacher, what if they actually brought the community in and they shared a little bit of their background and their investigation and their solutions and how the community could get involved. 
As I mentioned, I just shared with you two real solutions from two students. Well, here are two more students. This particular student, as you see here on the left, um, she created toxic free dyes because she was quite fashionable, as you can tell. And one thing she noticed is that a lot of the toxins um, in the waterway could easily be attributed to things that were washing down the drain. And a lot of things that were washing down the drain was makeup, was lipstick. And her being very fashionable was trying to look at a way to make eco-friendly um, cosmetics. And she did that. And that was her solution. And she actually um, went on to start a business around that. Now, you see the student here on the right. Um, he noticed that there's a flower shop right next to the waterway. And a lot of those um, flower uh, holders were going directly into the waterway because people would take the take their flowers out of the pot, put it in their own pot, and those you know plastic um, flower holders would go down to the waterway. So he was working directly with that flower shop to try to give them a way you know to create uh, more sustainable uh, materials for their flowers. And this you see here, you can hard to see them, but they're little newspapers. It's quite easy made out of newspaper you can put the flower in it and that then is what the flower shop was using so these solutions you know are personal to the kids they touch on something they're quite interested in a passion they're addressing a real problem a real investigation and they're impacting the community they're actually having a lasting effect okay and remember you know i told you at the beginning of this that i was going to uncover those three design principles we've uncovered a lot as to what can be done through project-based learning. And a lot of people have a misconception as to what project-based learning is. They think it's simply a teacher designing something where students have learned a bunch of facts and they say, now put together a presentation or put together a backboard or put together a model or a diorama and then present that to the class. And that's a start. But really when we use these three design principles, we can move projects that live in a classroom to having a real impact in the community. And here's what those three design principles are. So if you're taking notes, this is probably a time I would, uh, would take some notes here. Design principle number one, here is typically the way that we design units of study. Typically we'll take a subject specific topic. Okay, I think back in history class, that could be medieval Europe, um, government, you might look at geography, um, history, you know, economics, and you take a topic and typically you then design a unit. Don't do that anymore. Instead of taking a topic, instead design around a driving question that's going to address a real problem or challenge. Now, if you don't feel as comfortable just going to the community and finding those, look at your topic and develop a meaningful question around that topic. What is, how is that topic relevant in the real world. So if you are looking at government, obviously government is quite relevant now as we look at in the world and we see the effects of governments, the effects of laws. Um, I'm in Hong Kong. We can see the effects of government directly in terms of democracy. So think about a question related to that topic and you're going to see a lot more um, opportunities for a project uh, by starting with the driving question. Now, once you have your driving question, instead of a standardized test, so instead of having a question, for example, you might ask the question of, you know, how do governments influence people and how are laws made? Now, instead of having a standardized test at the end and saying, okay, test all the governments, um, you know, how laws are made, the process of it. What if you actually took students through a project to produce a real world product? So let's say it is government. Let's say your driving question is how laws are made to ensure that they help support citizens. Well, at the end, if students are going to look at that, they should actually be going through the process of making laws. So why not have students go through the process of creating a law? That's the project. The real world product is an actual law. I saw this project conducted in school. The students were actually making a bill of rights and laws for the school. Those laws or rules became part of the student handbook. So we don't even sometimes have to go outside our community. We could do it within our own school. So that's second, devise a real world product at the end. Third, 
once you have the beginning set with the driving question, the end set with the real world product, now it is time to fill in the gaps. Now all of a sudden it's not just your isolated content or skills from a chapter in your textbook, it's cross disciplinary content and skills according to many different subjects that are needed to answer that driving question. Your driving question sets the project in motion. It's connected to a real issue. There's a real product that students are going to create to address that. And all the stuff in the middle is a cross discipline content and are skills. And instead of doing something for one week or two days as a project, you're spending entire eight to 10 weeks going deep into learning to answer that driving question and asking students again to produce real products. These are the proposals that students produced here, as you see, and also the innovations. And most importantly to note is again, school is no longer going to be like learning for eight weeks and spending two days on a project. School is going to be about eight weeks of using the project to drive the learning. And what you're going to see from that is much more engagement, much more empowerment, really creating the kind of problem solvers, the kind of innovators that our world so desperately needs. And if you're interested in diving deeper into this whole concept and designing your own project-based experience, I'm starting a design certificate program. And the simple things you're going to learn through that You'll learn how to design this. We'll go a lot deeper where you'll work with the community in designing your own projects. Um, we had, again, teachers designing projects all the way from creating their own businesses and food trucks to creating documentaries on forgotten heroes in their community. Um, you'll learn how to integrate your content and skills. You'll create more empowered 21st century problem solvers and innovators. Again, that's there if you want to uh, quickly scan that and uh, you can find out more at transformschool.com. And again, here are here is my information. Uh, now, at, at Ivaya, I'm sure you probably have uh, time for questions potentially and answers. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Kaya. Um, thank you for taking us on that journey. Uh, thank you so, so much. Yeah, so this is a time where we talk about um, what our participants are saying and then we'll take questions please feel free um to drop your questions even now in the chat box we will be so glad to hear from you and um uh okay just oh, one i moment. can see those now i can see uh, the, okay. uh, the comments oh yeah. that's great that's great that's great that's great so i'm um, talking about the um the the water the water project um, we have RK from Singapore saying um, the effect of pollution on biodiversity, um, you know, the extinction of certain species of life and its negative effect on the ecosystem, like taking that as, as a component of the whole learning experience to say. Yeah. yeah, I think that's great. And I think that's addressing, obviously, you know, a larger concept, right? When you're looking at pollution and biodiversity, um, mm. That's not just a chapter of a textbook, right? I mean, that's covered. <laughs> yeah. Right? You have to go very deep because biodiversity, as itself, is a complex topic. But then you, you know, put mm. pollution to see the effect on that, and you know, that the only way you can answer that is really doing real investigations. So that's a, mm. that's a, a great uh, insight. Really, real investigations. Thank you so much, Kyle. So um, we are still. I think do we have a question here? I'm gonna take it straight down. Yeah, so Miss Evelyn says amazing job. Uh, Rake says wow, real Andy info. Yeah, so um, just to say a few things about um, um about this session, um, K to 12, 20, 30. Um, one of the things that Kai said um that stood out for me is the fact that we are now going to have an education system where project project is what is driving the learning, right? At the end of the whole thing, at the end of the day, all we have is that. These kids have real world product to show as the evidence of the learning experience. So the evidence of the learning experience will no longer be a grade, no longer be an A, a B, or a C or something. It's gonna be a product that has real community value. There are real societal value. 
and that's super amazing. So, Kai, can, can you speak? Can you speak a little to the issue of? Um, yeah, uh, because what we're doing now is that we are, we are killing the traditional kid itself. Like this conference is all about um, is an assassination. Like you know. I'm able to use that, but we're trying to assassinate the K to 12 traditional system, right? We're trying to kill it and say this is a new thing that should be happening in the K to 12 system, you know. Um, so, Kyle, can you for a moment touch the issue of um, the great thing and how the new K to 12 system looks like? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. I, I see someone here as well um, who said that that's their project, Miss Evelyn saying, is adult creating my own school is my most meaningful project, right? Um, and I think, you know, that starts with, here's a couple things, and, and I've written a book on this subject. I think the first thing that we need to do if we really want to innovate at a rapid rate is we need to start removing some of the big structures that are holding us back. So for example, if you're a very, very large school, you have so many schedules, right, that are interdependent on each other. You have kids going to six or seven different classes, and usually people try to innovate within a box, right? You try to say, okay, within these 45 minutes subjects, you know, instead of just just doing those, we're going to have one elective period, right? Or we're going to have one STEM period that's going to exist like twice a week. And I think we to really shake up education and really shake up and build schools of the future, we need to start kind of removing those shackles or systems that are holding us back and innovate rapidly. Um, so, for example, you know, can you within your school have a very small pocket of just a couple people that are trying something different? And if you're an administrator, I would really impress the administrators just to say let a couple teachers perhaps take one unit of study and just redesign it around a meaningful question or learning experience and see what the results are instead of standardized tests at the end of a particular experience have students present their learning and just see these kind of changes because i think there's a big talk about shaking up the whole system and i think that's necessary but you also you know have a lot you have a hundred years of history built on this kind of you know, industrial model. And it's not just going to happen overnight. So mm -hmm. wherever you're at with your teacher, start by just restructuring a unit. If you're from administration, think about what are some of the shackles that, you know, I've put on teachers that have made them have to perform for standardized tests or, you know, these schedules that are that have six periods a day and start to just take a couple of those things away and give some people more freedom or liberty. And what you're going to see is, you know, students are going to be speaking explicitly about their learning. They're gonna to start to, to be more engaged. They're gonna to start to be more empowered. And what I see generally is that becomes like a lever that moves the rest of the school in that kind of direction. Awesome, 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 awesome. That's good. Thank you, Kai. Thank you so, so much. And um, when we have this kind of system, what happens again is the fact that um, we are going to have an education system that is able to affect our economy, right? This is going to translate into an education system that is able to affect the economy of any country uh, because right from the grassroots we have um, we have a generation of young people who are being equipped right to do real stuff to solve real problems and you know um, if 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 for example say I'm here in Nigeria you know um, we have a kind of system that is dependent on that we are only raising our kids to solve problems then I can be sure that the future of Nigeria is going to be filled with less problems and more solutions because we have a system that is practically designed to solve just only problems all right and the, and the pool and the voting is not about an exam that's going to happen and then when there's no exam there's no there's nothing much happening and all of that um so i, I read about china that china is doing something um made in china 2025 um an agenda that says that by 2025 um china wants to ensure that um everything they use in the country is made within china right um everything they use within the country right so i i, Kyle, I, I know i know that's going to influence the education system to like right i i mean yeah that will that, that will certainly influence the education system i, I think it's hard to be a, a global um place if everything is just made you know locally within your country i understand I understand the desire, right, to do that because you're trying to promote your own kind of domestic products and innovation within your own country. But a lot of that is going to ride on, um, you know, sharing knowledge um, with with other places. So, so we'll see we'll see how that comes up. I don't know if you have a particular question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree with you that um, um, a lot of things are going to be there for many places. I totally agree with you. Um, and that's that's just the truth. All right. So once again, Kai, thank you so much uh, for taking us on this journey. Um, yeah. The three design principles, 
right? Uh, that's the peak, that's, that's the peak of the session for me. The key design principles, um, the driving question, um, the reward products, and then at the end of the day, um, what it stands to be, what it leads to, right? It's something that is cross disciplinary. Um, the new model as as will be developed within the future of K to twelve. And um, um, this is a time after this session, we expect everyone to start experimenting, right? To start doing something about this. We have to reimagine what happens in our classrooms and with learning, and we have to really start thinking about this design principle. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Kyle. Um, thank you, Kai, for your time. Um, thank you for bringing this to us again. I, I can tell you that this is so, so phenomenal. And, you know, um, our participants here are saying great things, amazing job. Um, um, this is the first presentation. Um, RK says is a really handy info. Yes, yeah, something that um, one can really get working on real time. Thank you, Kai, for this. This is amazing, right? So um, we're sure. about to move to the next. Uh, we're about to move to the next presentation. Well, if you need um, if you need Kyle, Kyle's um, details, you can get across. Um, I, I'm going to provide it to you. Um, Kyle, Kyle, be more than glad uh, to reach. Kyle is open um, to a conversation. I'm more than glad to, to talk about. Um, to talk do you about, want me to answer that uh, question? But then, yes, quiet, quiet. Yeah, quiet. It's on the screen. Okay. Um, so one of the questions is how do students get the buy-in from the target audience, like the flower shop to use the paper containers, and uh, the young lady convincing to sell a product? I will say that uh, the way at least that the student got the supermarkets buy-in is because a lot of those uh, shoppers became more concerned about renewable bags. So I'd say like when it comes to projects, think about the stakeholders. And when you're asking students to consider the number of stakeholders, if you can change public opinion, like that's huge, right? That student can go to the supermarket and the supermarket can say, well, yeah, but our, our, our customers aren't demanding, you know, renewable bags. But she got enough of the customers to demand to use renewable bags that it started taking off and, and, and gaining traction. So I'd say the same thing with a flower shop. You've got to show the incentive too that, hey, this is lower cost, it's helping the environment. And in fact, I can make a lot of these for you and it, it's going to impact more than just the environment. It's gonna impact your business as well. So these are uh, other things they have to think of. Super, super, thank you, Kyle. And this is, and this is what we're talking about. All right, this is what we're talking about. This is this will drastically break break down, reduce the gap between school and reality. You see that white gap between school and reality, and this really puts um, um, kids in a place where they are in an atmosphere of the reality, right? So I believe we need an atmosphere of a reality to prepare for that reality. So everything we are seeing right now is that K to twelve is going to become an atmosphere of a reality that is existing that can exist and then that prepares kids for that same. So once again, thank yeah, you, Kai. Can I make you one more thing? Yes, please, go ahead. Yes. I want to mention too is I think a lot of people think, like let's say, let's take the metaverse, right? The metaverse is a concept and some people are like, everything's going to be happening in the metaverse. You're going to be creating an alternate world, which I think is great. But if you don't change the core delivery of a learning experience, the meta world is going to be is going to replicate the same thing as that we've always done school we had smart boards come in we thought that was going to revolutionize you know learning stem is great but it's sometimes only delivered in one or two periods the metaverse could be great but learning experiences need to be designed right with students addressing real issues whether that's in the metaverse you know or whether that's in school the technology is only as good as the design of the learning experience so i just kind of you know want to stress that as we think of the future don't think in terms of the metaverse because that might be you might say hey that's way beyond me i've never even ventured there think of a learning experience design once you have that solid you can transfer that over to whatever kind of technology comes about yeah that's huge that's huge thank you kai for mentioning that that's that's really huge um that's that, that's a problem again with um with um the many ed techs we have globally today um technology products are not really the, the experience is not really what we want to see we want something more Right. Thank you, Kyle, for, for pointing that out again. Uh, that's super. All right, Kyle, thank you so much for your time. You are amazing and you are the best. Thank you for sharing this golden stuff with us. Thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. Thank yeah, so us. Kyle, yeah, bye for now. Yeah, so it's really been an awesome time with Kyle. Um, I must say a super awesome time. Uh, just one moment.
here. Right, so if you are still there, um, um, this is K to 12, 2030. I believe the first session has, has, has taken you on the journey, right? And again, we're about to enter into the second session. Before we jump on the second session, um, for the next one, two minutes, you want to reflect on what you've heard in the past uh, 45 minutes, minutes there about, and think of how it could impact what you have right now. Um, it might look big and it might look huge, but I tell you there are simple steps you can begin to take uh, from what you're doing right now that can revolutionize what your kid looks like. If you're a school leader, a school owner listening to us in this conference, right? The three design principles are powerful and something for you to spend some time to think about even with your team and get, get something started. Yeah, so thank you for staying with us. And um, we are going to be moving into the second session for today. And then um, I have um, Jessica and, um, and I also have um, Rosaline um, with us right here. Hello, ladies. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you for um, joining us in this conference. Thank you for um, sharing your time with us. Um, this is so valuable. This is golden, and we really appreciate it. Uh, so I remember that the, the last time we we had this duo was during the PBL festival, and then you know um, we were celebrating project, right? We've been talking about and we're celebrating projects and trying to bring that to the spotlight how that k to 12 is changing is evolving right uh, and you know that is where it is right now and i, I remember jessica sharing some wonderful projects um you know, with us in that meeting and that was a great one and again today um we are so expectant um in this session right we're looking at um building, integrating Agile, right, into the school environment, bringing Agile into the school environment, right? We know that one of the disruption that must happen to k is that k must become Agile, right? We need Agile classrooms. Why? Simply because the word out there, it's now a word of agility. Um, Agile is one thing that has been mentioned in the world of project and project management in the real world and in reality. And so saying that k has to, has to become Agile is a, is a current need, like it has to happen every school right now globally must embrace agile right and um, um jessica and rosaline um they, they are the co-founders of agile mind and um they have been doing a whole lot of things um you know in helping educators to translate into building agile classrooms and we are so excited to have them on this show um, on this conference rather as they will be um you know um talking about how to build an agile classroom how do you integrate Agile into your school environment? Um, so Jessica, let me confirm that you're ready. Rosalie, let me confirm that you're ready. Mm -hmm. Yep. Super, super. So I am ready for a mental flight, and I believe that every participant right now watching us live, they're ready for the mental flight. So I'm just going to step down and hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. We are so excited to be here today and speaking to everyone about what our passion is. Um, we are just about to kick off. Yeah, give me one second. Sorry, hold on. I am going to share my screen. Is everyone able to see what I'm sharing, hopefully? It just came up. So we're just waiting for it to load, Roz. OK, perfect. OK, we're up and running. All right, so I will keep going. Um, first, thank you for um, allowing us to speak to you today about how we can use agility to transform education and prepare our students for the future. Um, I'm Roz Jackson and my partner is Jessica Cavallaro. Um, for us, we are, our focus as educators is to help students um, be prepared for the future inside of our classroom and beyond. Um, that became extremely difficult, like everything became difficult for us and other stakeholders, students, parents, teachers during the pandemic. Um, specifically for us, we noticed um, how hard it was for our students to stay connected, to be able to communicate effectively with each other and to participate in meaningful ways, the way we tried to have them do before the pandemic, um, interacting with projects similar to what Kyle was talking about 
and the pandemic just made that a little more difficult and the students became disconnected. So luckily Jessica stumbled onto Scrum and through that to Agile. And now we were able to see, which we're going to share with you later in the presentation, how incorporating those Agile methods within our inquiry-based kind of teaching just solidified and brought back those communication, collaboration, those SEO skills that we knew those students needed to be able to make them successful. And through the use of Agile methods, we found that a change in the paradigm of how the world works or no matter what is thrown at them, the students and the teachers would be able to succeed no matter the circumstances. And so definitely our goal in sharing this with you is to make sure that you know that no matter what the circumstances, you can empower your students to be able to create their own learning paths and that they can acquire the skills that they need to succeed in your class, no matter the curriculum, and they can succeed beyond your classroom and they will absolutely be prepared for the future. So what we are going to go through today really quickly, our agenda is we're gonna talk about status of K-12 education right now. We're going to ask you and invite you to think about ways that you might want to change that status, what's going on in K-12 education today. Um, what skills do you use now in your professional lives and your personal lives that you think should be implemented in education now? And after we share some things with you, we are going to um, talk about the benefits of an agile education. And then we're going to invite you to spread the word about how good it is, hopefully once we convince you. Okay, so we are also, um, as educators, we don't like sitting up here and just talking and talking and talking at you. So if you have any feedback for us, feel free to interact with us. There's several points in our presentation where we ask um, for your input. So please engage with us, talk to us, send us messages. We love interacting with an audience and helping to clarify any issues or concerns or questions that you might have, okay? so. Currently, our education system is failing the major stakeholders, and our major stakeholders are students, parents, and teachers. Our students are failing because they're disengaged. After the pandemic, our students came back. They're not interested in the old style of learning anymore. They're watching a creator's economy erupt all around them. They're seeing people um, in regular jobs, like the traditional kind of jobs, um, not being as successful as they were in the past, and they're watching technology move past them at, an, at a ever advancing rate. And as they're watching this, the world around them is getting more complex and more ambiguous, and they're dealing with bigger and bigger problems that um, their generation is going to have to tackle. So they're, the idea of going into their social studies class or their English class and doing the same kind of lesson is not engaging to them anymore. So we need to reach out to meet our students where they are. The next major uh, impact is on parents. And we see this in the news all the time. Parents don't know where education's going. They're, they're concerned about their future. They're concerned about their children's future. Are children learning the skills that they need to be successful? Is all of this work, all this homework, all these projects, are they doing the student really good? And will they prepare them for a very uncertain future for most of us? And then lastly, we have the teachers who are definitely stakeholders in this because they're working every day. And teachers are getting their, their creativity and their agency is being stripped from them by curriculums being pushed down from federal and state governments. There's testing that it, that is um, becoming more and more part of our school time. So it more of their time goes out to testing and test prep than actually creating lessons. And their wages haven't been, been raised and teachers are Facing the great rate resignation, unlike any other profession in America or probably worldwide. Um, so we need to make significant changes that are hitting the foundation of where our stakeholders are. We always need to come back to where, who are the people that we need to serve and how can we serve them best? Sorry. Let me move that over. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to ask you really quick to think about what did your K through 12 experience look and feel like. So for this, if you have any scrap paper near you, something to write with very quickly, 
we want you to try to imagine this, but we're actually going to have you do a quick project, okay? So we're gonna ask you to do a storyboard. So the scrap paper that you have, if you can, and it's only gonna take about a couple of minutes, um, we're going to ask you to divide your paper, if you can, if it's regular eight and a half by 11 paper, if you can divide it into eight squares. So you're going to fold it the way we call it here in the States, sort of like hot dog style to where it's a long vertical piece. And then you're going to fold both of those in half twice. And that should give you about eight squares if I did that right. Um, so we're going to ask you to take about 60 to 120 seconds. Either you can write quick texts or you can draw pictures. Think about what students go through for eight hours out of the day. So what does a traditional classroom day look or feel like? So this is actually, and for you, so think about what your user story was when you were back in school. For me, that was about a few decades ago. But if when you were back in school, what did it look like for you? What did it feel like? What was your user's story? And if you'd like us to drop us messages, please, we're, we're so happy to hear from you. So if you'd like to just write in and tell us about it um, or the picture that you can pull together in your head, drop us some messages so that yeah. we can um, explore with you. That's right. So whatever method is easier, you can go ahead and do that. Okay. Adebayo, are you able to see any other messages? Because I can't. And we're about 30 seconds in. Yeah, so not yet, but then um, as soon as I get one, uh, I'll just put it on the screen so you can see it. Oh, okay. thank you so much. Now, storyboarding is a great technique to be using in a classroom, so it's great for presentations, but it's also great for your students. Anything that you can get to work visually significantly helps with the learning experience. So this is one of those ways that we're bringing to you elements that we use in our classroom so that you can uh, see the advantages and share them out with either your students or your children or, you know, even in the workspace, it, it works as a great way to to visualize a different um, mode of thinking. Absolutely. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip and we're going to give you possibly one picture. So at least for, definitely for us in the States, this is what our traditional educational day at least felt like. We were seated in rows, everybody had seats, mostly assigned seats teacher out of the front, in the front of the room, directing instruction. We're taking notes. Um, if you had a nice teacher, you could ask questions. If not, you just ducked your head, covered, took the notes, and then commiserated with your friends after about how much or how little you understood. So if any of your classroom experiences were similar to that, then you're in the right place because we're going to try to help you improve that for you as either a teacher or for your students. So now that we went through that exercise of trying to visualize what a school day is, and I think that that's really important because we're sending our students to school for eight hours a day. And very often, we don't think about what that user experience is for them. They come in with their backpack. They sit in English first. They pick up their backpack. They go to social studies. They sit down. They go to math. They, uh, they sit down. They go to lunch. They finally get to talk to their friends. They go to science. They sit down. They go to Spanish. They sit down. So we don't really think about that when we're talking about education, when we're talking, when you hear people that are writing curriculum, they're not really engaging. They're saying, what do the students need, but not what is the student's life like? And so we want to pose the question of what is the purpose of school? Do they just need information? Is it just about gaining content? Is it um, 
what are they, what is the purpose of learning? And is our, our curriculum currently assessing that level of learning? Are we giving them the kinds of tools that they can absolutely pick up and use and be purposeful with in the world? Or are we just spending time with them? Are we just filling their head with things that they can find on Google? So we wanted to introduce to you what an agile classroom looks like. And so as you can see in these pictures, these are not desks in rows. These are not with the teacher standing in front of the room. You can see that the students own this space. They take over the entire space. It is theirs. They are comfortable in it. They are collaborating. There is student work everywhere. They are able to get up and move. As you can see in a lot of these different pictures, there's different modalities of seating because students are human beings that don't all want to fit in a desk. They're comfortable in different spaces just like we are. And so if we want to choose where we want to sit, so do our students. Our classrooms are filled with student work. You notice there is not one thing written by us anywhere. <laughs> it is all filled with student work. There's no posters, there's no pictures, it's all student work. Students take over the space and they feel comfortable in it, they can express themselves in it, and they can diagram this picture I love, is it students diagramming their thought process. And now this looks in, uh, different in each of our rooms. Some of us have more high tops, some of us have more low tops, and even, I believe it's in the next picture, we have plexiglass because of um, COVID, but the kids use that as a tool, they made it their own. And so when you invite kids into an agile classroom, it's their space. And we can look at this and it even looks like some boardrooms that you have the space to, to stretch out, that you can brainstorm, that you are comfortable in the space and that you can use all of the space for your learning. So you really um, can fill the whole space with education. And this is a picture that shows you too that your classroom, when you start the year, um, some teachers like to decorate and make the space comfortable for the students. Um, a little pushback from me is that a lot of times I think that teachers are trying to make it comfortable for themselves because as educators, we spend a lot of time in the room. But if we're talking about what the purpose of education is, the purpose of education is for the students. So our mentality is more so to start off your classroom as a blank canvas to where the students can control what is presented to share their learning to have their thought spaces and every single surface, including the walls, the students can write on. The plexiglass, the tables, the walls, everything. So this slide, what we've been comparing so far is the current way or the current framework of education, which is push-based versus pull-based. And so we're gonna talk about a few of those differences right now. So in a push-based system, for example, is teacher-led instruction. You control the content, you tell them what unit you're doing, what unit they're doing, you tell them what questions to answer, you tell them when everything is due, and the students have no say. In a poll-based system, students are in charge. And think about how much students want, or young children that are developing want a say in their own life. This is a safe environment in which they can start to refine those kinds of skills about, about what they want and have some kind of control in their life. So it is a poll-based system in that they pull their education to them. So you, as a teacher, you will give the work up front and students will pull what they need when they need it. This is a way that we can large scale produce personalized education because our kids with processing issues can pull a little slower. Our kids that um, need enrichment activities can pull a little faster. They're all able to pull at their own rate instead of everyone marching together at the same beat. In a push-based system, it is content-based only. If your students need to know scientific method or they need to know the War of 1812 or they need to know certain verbs or nouns or language in Spanish or French, it's only that content. It's not based on a particular problem. It's not necessarily even something they care about. Um, it is something that they can Google in five minutes or five seconds. It is not something that's going to stretch their minds and have them problem solve. They need to know the content, they test, and that's it. In a poll-based system, you still have content that you're working through, but it's much more skill-based. So as students pull their information, they have to work collaborative with, 
collaboratively with teams. They need to connect with one another. They need to decide their timeline. They need to organize themselves. They need to build things. They need to go through the design process. So they're building all of these extra skills along the way that comes with having agency. So instead of being passive in their learning, they're being very active in their learning and they're developing all of those soft skills that we value in, in life. And in a push-based system, finally, student agency is minimized um, because, quite frankly, in a push-based system, teachers don't necessarily have time to give students agency, or it's hard to craft if you are not very particular and focused about doing that. Um, students don't have a choice about which content to study or what content to study, what assignments to do. So you are directing their content, you are directing how they are learning the content, uh, they have no choice in how they present. There's no choice boards. There's no, um, well, I prefer to do pictures for this. It's like, no, you must do write it out in sentences or write your definitions. So their choices are gone, which means they're in, their engagement is gone. And once you test them, the knowledge is out of the window because they've not been able to apply it. In a poll-based system, obviously student agency is encouraged. The teacher is no longer the leader of the classroom, they're the facilitator. So they go from group to group or person to person facilitating learning, asking probing questions, pushing the kids to uh, explore more and deepen their critical thinking. Students get to make decisions about how they're applying the content. So they are still learning content just like they would in a traditional pulpit push-based classroom, but now they're applying it to something else. So they are, they are taking it, they are making it personalized, they are developing skills. It is a much more rich learning environment than a standard push-based uh, environment. So what we have seen and this is a study that just came out of McKenzie, um, which explored what hiring managers were looking for for future hiring. And so what has changed significantly in the past few years is that uh, employers are not really looking for people with degrees or certain certifications anymore. They're looking for skill bases. What kind of skills do you hold that could be valuable for the or the industry that you're coming into. And their top skills fall into these four domains, cognitive, interpersonal, self-leadership, and digital. And through this extensive study, these are the top skills that they're looking for. But let me ask you this, in a um, standard push-based education system, do students get to refine these kinds of skills? Do they have an opportunity to do goal achievement? Do they have an idea of how to work in teams? Are they able to have flexible cognitive thought plans. This is the kind of uh, skills that we really need to be concentrating on as we know that, that technology is changing our world and pushing us forward. So what we want to focus on now is to show you the reasons why we believe the future of education is agile. So what we've tried to hit on previously is that students need to know skills, not just content. The content, they can Google. They can find it in 20 seconds, okay? But how to apply that content to their own personal situations, because water quality, like Kyle was saying, might not be an issue for where I live, but it might be an issue, especially for us in the States, in Flint, Michigan. It might not be an issue for a certain location where you are, but it might be an issue for someone else on another part of the world. So the skills that they are learning are going to help them apply the content to whatever situation that they find themselves in, even beyond your classroom. So we know from different studies that agility adds value to every industry in which it is applied. Why can't we do that in education? But we're gonna show you that we've tried it and it works. So just to refresh for those of us that are not familiar with Agile, these are the 12 principles of agility. And if you can look through this without going into a deep dive about what Agile is and um, getting very in the weeds in that kind of way, because we're looking at it from an educational lens, these 12 principles, if you look through them just quickly, you can see how they can be applied to education. Our customer satisfaction is our stakeholders, like we talked about earlier. We need good design. We need simplicity. We need reflection. We need constant reflection. We need interactions. We need teamwork. These are, are um, the, the pure tenets of Agile that we believe is what makes it so successful in our educational settings. 
So we want you to think again. This time we want you to think about 30 seconds, okay? So whether you're storyboarding, you are gonna put it in the comments or you're just going to imagine it. What do you think a, a good educational day would look like in an agile environment? So think about from the things that we've told you, the difference between traditional education and what an agile education could look like. What kind of user experience or user story would happen in that classroom? Think on it for about 30 seconds. And which one would you want your students in or your children in? Halfway there. All right. So what we want to do is share with you some examples to show you why we believe that the future of education is agile. Now, these are some artifacts from our room, but as you can see, one of our first artifacts is how students plan their learning. So this is this is the definition of poll based is that you can see with this picture all the way on the end that we gave our students an entire project. They built out an entire backlog. They color coded. They broke down large projects into very small tasks that they could accomplish. And then they pull them across the board. You can see that in that other picture as well, where it's color coded. They're learning how to make checklists. So these are all skills just planning their project that they never get in a traditional classroom. And these are skills that we're required as adults to do every single day. So why would we not give our students the opportunity to try these things and then refine them in the safety of their K-12 education? The other picture over here is a burn down chart. So students can track to see how fast they are moving through their work and if they're building velocity. And so this group uh, was very successful in getting their work done, but they were able to track it. And that way they knew if there was issues coming with their workflow and if there was discussions that needed to be had. So this lends itself to collaboration, communication, transparency, again, all skills that we need to be functional adults. And at the top is an example of another project management tool, communication tool is a Kanban board. And so this is just a quick snapshot of one of the student teams using their Kanban board and being able to check their flow of their work as well. In this artifact, we had a project that was actually about social contract theory. So they were reading about John Locke and Thomas Hobbes, guys that were that lived in the 1600s. And students took the idea of social contract theory and they used it to prototype an app in which constituents could better communicate with their representatives in Congress because they felt like there needed to be more transparency in government. This one is for um, science class where the students actually created a salt scrub. And this was no, not just for them to have like a spa day in class. They had to create a unit where they were gonna teach students about the difference between rocks and minerals and their interrelationships. But they also had to come up with their own lab activity and how rocks and minerals were used in the real world. This um, unit about rocks and minerals, typically I can get maybe one or two labs that the students can do. For this unit, when they used agile methods and each group had to create their own lab, I got about 30 labs out of that unit and every one was different. So the amount of learning that improved in this unit from one year to the next was exponential and it was all student created. This artifact is students learning about the American Revolution. So instead of just reading a book or going through it, they created their own timelines. They had full agency in how they designed them and what to include. So they really got to take their interest. So while they learned the content of the whole thing, they had to use design processes to figure out their visuals and then make it more tactile. So students that enjoyed art got to make things, students that enjoyed reading, got to do their reading. So they were pulling the information to them as they wanted and as best, best fit their learning needs. And then they were able to show it. They then took this information. And on the next slide, they learned about the Bill of Rights and they used the questioning um, 
technique that we had taught them to ask questions about the amendments. And as you can see, they filled up the walls with questions. So instead of doing a traditional research paper where I would give a topic or I would give a prompt and then they would do the research and have to write it, they created their own questions that they were interested in. They prioritized their learning. They found their own research. They pulled the research to them. They synthesized the information and then they wrote complex research papers about how documents created in the 1700s uh, were interacting with society in 2022. This one, and I'm sorry if the pictures are a little bit fuzzy um, and pixelated, but this one again is related to their rocks and minerals unit. Um, so those of us that know anything about home improvement or you watch HGTV, um, we know that people love porcelain or granite countertops. Um, and so what the students did, they were talking about how rocks and minerals are used in construction. And so they actually had each one of the students in class build or manufacture their own granite tabletops. And so not just with the content we're students learning here, they also learned a little bit about construction as well, different skills. This was another one that these students decided to focus on the difference um, between the structures of rocks and minerals. So of course they used their favorite thing, food, to challenge the students to construct the different um, the different molecular structures of different types of basic minerals that we find on the earth. This one was a project where we we're talking about earthquakes and how could they build earthquake resistant homes and what were the best types of structures to do that. So this is based on um, an earthquake that they saw that happened in Peru. So they actually reconstructed um, adobe clay which is the typical material that they use to construct in Peru, but then they compared the cost of doing that versus the cost of using wood and the cost of using cement. And they created an earthquake type of simulator platform in which to test the stability of each one of the structures that they built. In this unit, students had to read the entire US Constitution. And instead of just taking it and thinking about it and drawing diagrams of checks and balances or the United States Congress, they took that information and used an applied game design. So they had to go through the design process. They had to prototype their game. They had to play it through to make sure there wasn't issues. Um, they had to reflect upon changes. They had to think about the users that would be you know, targeting what age group and what level of sophistication. And then they had to create a game. So they took an entire document about systems and then transformed it into games using systems thinking. And there is really nothing more important for our kids to learn uh, at this time in this technological evolution than systems thinking. And so our kids were able to take a document, again, written in the 1700s and transform it into an interactive game that can teach other students about the constitution. So here are a couple of testimonials from the students um, because as educators, we saw how well they did and how much more knowledge they gained. Um, but these are a couple of the statements from them. Um, the things that stand out to us are that before this, one student was more of a follower than a leader. And a key that what another student learned was how to problem solve. And that's something that in traditional education, they are not always given the opportunity to do. And if you just look at the key words in their testimonials, we're talking about students developing the skills that will make them successful in the future. We see communicating, creativity, leadership, working in groups, uh, sharing my ideas, having leadership, resourcefulness. These are the things we want our students to be cultivating. These are the kinds of things that when our students come home from school and say, hey, I've, I solved a problem today. These are the, th are the things that we know will bring them a brighter future. Um, and so through an agile classroom, we are refining these skills over and over again through K through 12 education. So by the time that they reach 12th grade, they're able to erupt into the world and solve these complex, ambiguous problems that we're facing right now. And on top of that, what makes um, what we do so spectacular 
is that as students go through our K to 12 education and they learn agility through that process that they're always they're already going through, they can earn blockchain based micro credentials. So what does that mean to the average person is that we're not just handing out certificates that we print off of our HP in the corner and saying, good job, you did this. These are skill badges that they can put on their college resumes and their regular resumes to show that they have mastered different types of skills and different kinds of learning uh, that will certify them in order to uh, work in different professions and different jobs right out of 12th grade. And there's really, when we think about the purpose of education, we're pushing kids through K to 12 education. And then at the end we say, okay, great, go for more school now, you're still not prepared. Is that what our system is, is really supposed to be doing? If we are able to push agility into these schools and, and get our kids to refine this learning all the way through, they can graduate 12th grade, not only with a degree from high school, but with blockchain based micro credentials that can get them in the door in hundreds of different companies. So they can start their lives at 18 instead of going into student debt in higher ed and having to refine the skills that we already spent all this time teaching. And how much more prepared will they be at the age of 18 if they're going through an education where they problem solve and develop critical thinking and learn how to speak and learn how, learn how, to, how to brainstorm and think outside of the box and they're not afraid to tackle complex problems this is the kind of education that we can see our students going through, our kids going through, and, and think of how great the world would be if our 18 year olds were coming out of high school ready to take on the, the, the world and really prepared. So this is how we are working to spread the word. Uh, with the Agile Mind, we actually offer coaching and training for students, um, teachers, admin, families who want it. So with, and we do it in five main areas. So we do it related to school, academically with students and teachers, they can learn Agile methods to add value to anything they're doing in their academic lives. Um, we have a, what we call the flow bundle. So between the curriculum development, improvement kata, family Kanban, any type of training that you would like, um, you can personalize it to fit your own personal needs. Curriculum development is specifically for educators to make sure that if anybody wants to transform their current kind of classroom experience into an agile one, we offer long-term coaching to help support them because the goal is to make sure that we can give this experience to as many students and teachers as possible. And to do that is to share what we know. Um, the other thing is that these agile methodologies, they help in academically, but also personally, and we have done both. So we wanna make sure that we improve the collaboration and communication among families, especially. So if they learn how to do this in their personal lives, it is an easy flow and carry over into their academic and professional lives as well. And the improvement kata is the first step to do that. So you set big goals based on the vision that you have for your life, and then you are able to achieve those goals in those small iterative steps. So those big goals don't seem so big and you accomplish them sooner than you think. The way that we are offering these is to bring agility into every part of the life. So if you um, want to reach out to teachers and say, hey, come check this out, I think it would be good for you because it really um, significantly helps the life of a teacher. Um, it significantly helps the life of a student, but we can bring it to a homeschool. We can bring it to a house. You can uh, refine these skills in any kind of setting. So we want to make sure that our next generation of students is getting the best possible education, whether that's in the classroom, outside of the classroom, in the home experience, uh, from homeschool, in any way that we can help get kids prepared and give them a better education we have created uh, different courses and different ways to bring agility into their lives. And so what we want you to do is definitely help us spread the word. So definitely you can contact us on LinkedIn. Um, you can go to our website. Um, you can contact us via email. We even have a YouTube page where we invite people to ask us questions and we can answer them through short videos that explain how some of the tools that we actually featured on here, here like right. using a Kanban board, what that is, um, how we can help teachers create lessons using a Kanban board that gives access to students um, synchronously and asynchronously. 
Um, there are different things that we have on the YouTube page. So feel free to scan that, check it out. And of course you can email us or connect us, connect with us on LinkedIn to ask us questions because then that gives us um, the opportunity to answer those questions, which other people probably have, but we can spread the word wider on our YouTube channel with the answers to those questions as well. So if you are convinced or at least intrigued to learn more and you want to share this presentation with some others in your school or some others in your profession, other parents that you might think are interested, um, we have a QR code to this presentation and um, share it with others. Have them reach out to us as well so that we can help impact more teachers, help energize them in the midst of the great resignation, those who want to stay in the classroom, give them the incentive and the tools to stay, and the students that we know might need that help to be able to become more engaged, become um, more empowered to create their own learning paths, we can help them do that as well. And the parents as well. So we are really invested in changing uh, the impact of education for all of the major stakeholders. So how can we help bring agility to you? Please spread the word uh, and let us know if you have any questions uh, or just ideas, or if you would just like to talk about this. And that's it. We thank you for your time. If there thank are any questions, so we'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Super, super. Thank you. That, that was awesome. All right, that was awesome. How to build a agile, uh, an agile classroom? I, I have a question here. Um, uh, I have a question here. The question says, um, "Where is that?" I'm gonna get the question. One sec. Okay. Yeah. So it says, um, "I think it's a chemistry teacher." It says, um, "I've tried allowing learners." space um, talking about agency um, in chemistry practical class and they turn it into a playground what do you think Try and chemistry. usually if you want flexible seating it has to come with some rules and some understanding in the building of a classroom culture i'm sure that you have a great classroom culture um, but students need to understand that that can go so one of the ways that i um, install a good classroom culture when I have flexible seating or I let them move around a lot is we have a discussion about it at the beginning of the year and I give them the purpose for why I'm allowing it so that they understand that it's not just a playground and it's not just for them to jump around on but the purpose of flexible seating is that each student uh, can learn in their in a comfortable setting and so we go through and we take a, a gardener's multiple intelligence quiz they learn about the different ways that they learn they write reflections about how they think they learn best they are forced to try different seating. So for the first two weeks, they have to move around the classroom and see what angle works for them and what type of seating works for them. So they really, we run it, and I run a humanities classroom, we run it as an experiment. And so they value the fact that they get choice in seating. And for those that really cannot handle it, and every once in a while there are students that cannot handle it, you need to have a one-to-one -one conversation with them and help them pick a seat together. And sometimes that is just what it is. It's just what happens when you work with kids. All kids are different. So it's just um, having that agile mindset of being able to adapt to the needs of each student. And luckily with an agile classroom, you have enough free time because you're not teaching every single lesson from the front of the room that you have time for those kinds of conversations. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And for I that. Do, please go ahead, please if, go if I can add one thing to about the about the seating and having it become game time. A part of that is too, is um, how the lessons are curated and planned. Um, we talked about the students being able to pull the learning to them. Part of that is when you have an agile classroom, it's not like you're sitting there kicking your feet up. It's still work, um, but you're planning the lessons anyway, right? So now you're just not giving it to the students in chunk you're giving it to them it's like a plan almost like when you went to secondary school you went to college um you knew the course syllabus from day one so it's almost like you're doing that but you're doing that with k-12 to students 
And so the thing is, you're still curating the um, the assignments you want them to do, the primary sources. Are there different websites you want? Are there different videos that you want them to watch? Are there video lessons to where you're doing an aspect of a flipped classroom for them? Are there certain texts or snippets of text? Ed tech tools like Newzello, you want them to do a flip grid to do a reflection. Um, it's all there. They can see everything that you want to do, even if it's divided sort of by section, depending on how much agility you want to give. If you're a little bit nervous about doing that, every single unit where I apply those different things is different. There are some when I first started, they did not have as much freedom as I give them now because, yes, teachers are control freaks. So a part of it is, like Jessica said, it is an experiment in and of itself. But as you see, when you start to give up control, um, they rise to the occasion. And so some of those students, yes, we teach middle school. There are middle school students. And no matter what kind of class you have, whether it's an agile classroom or a traditional one, there are always going to be those students that need a little extra push. There are always going to be those students where today they didn't come to school to work. And so, but other times though, when you give them the opportunity and you're asking them, which assignment are you going to do today? Where are you in the status? This group over here, they are able to do this. And when you have an agile classroom, everything is transparent. Everybody can see who is working, who is not. And peer pressure is a bad thing, but it can also be good because they see, hey, this group, they're understanding this. Do I need to go over there and ask them? Can I get some kind of peer guidance? And so sometimes, yes, they're off task, but sometimes I watch them when they're off task and I also watch them figure it out. So they're, if things are planned accordingly. And again, it won't be perfect every day, but if you have those plans, the different curated activities, the different seating or procedure, if some student is off task, those things, you can help them find the solution to those things as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, sure it does, sure it does. Sure it does. Uh, and, and that's the agile methodology in the classroom. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Um, uh, this has been an awesome time. Yeah, really, it has been a mental flight, um, taking us into what um, uh, K to twelve classrooms can become. Uh, so, for school owners and school leaders who are listening to us in this session, um, I believe you already have you are catching a new vision um, for what can happen in your classroom, right? You want to embrace um, the agile methodology um, because these kids are going into a world of agility, right? Um, of course, um, the, the top, the top, the top companies right all over the world, they are they are all embracing the agile Scrum framework. That's that's how they work. That's that's how they roll. And so, if you are preparing kids who are able to fit into that, you know, I I I one of the things that we see today is the fact that um, a lot of companies are trying to do agile, they're trying to do Scrum, but then um, they are they are they have people working with them who don't have these skills, and it mm -hmm. gives them a lot of problem. And um, you know, of course, because some of them just want to, oh, oh, oh we need to start doing, we need to start doing Scrum. But then these workers they've had with them who have not, who didn't learn this, right? Bringing them into the system becomes a really tough thing, right? Because they didn't have that foundation, and that's why we see that even now, K to twelve must be that must be held responsible for laying that foundation, right? For raising kids who at an early age are beginning to build skills, you know, um, for an agile world, I've, be, I've become. You know, already become exposed. I love what you said, Jessica, when you talk about the fact that, um, you know, instead of at the beginning of the term, teachers are, you know, it's just conventional. Teachers are everywhere. They are designing things in the classroom. Everything is all planned, right? They set aside a day to come and decorate the classroom. And, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> and then where's the space for creativity for the kids, right? So when you said it's their space, yeah, I said, yes, yeah, that space is meant for the kids. We need, we need to allow them to own that space. That space should be for them to explore their creativity, not for the teachers to explore their creativity. That sounds really disruptive, and um, um, but it's just the truth, so to say. You know, <laughs> it's just the truth. We really can. It's just the truth. We, we need a space where these kids can explore, um, mm -hmm. where nothing is really blocking them, right? This is how. This is how. Um, so when we talk about um, 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 Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. Um, I'm sure that it got to a time where when this idea of Facebook was popping up, um, he had an environment 
that was that, that allowed them to really explore it right mm -hmm. so if you have many of these kids who are innovators in those classrooms the only way we can let loose those innovations is by creating an atmosphere like an agile one like we're talking about here that allows them to explore every innovation that they could carry yeah we have a lot of people we have well, a lot of people that are greater than Mark, you know, in those classrooms, in those schools, they are there. But who knows, um, if we don't make it agile, we are not creating a platform for them to unleash every innovation they carry, right? Thank you once again, Rose. Thank you once again, Jessica, for um, bringing us to this place, for expounding this. Um, of course, like, you know, if you, if you would like to connect with um, Rosalie and Jessica, all right, um, you can, you can um, as well reach out to me, all right? Um, that's, that's quite easy. You can reach out to me, right? I'll get you connected. And you can be a part of what they are doing too, you know, um, every now and then, right? So, um, w would you like to say one more word before we uh, before we round up this session? We want to move to the third one. No, thank you so much for having us. We're always happy to talk uh, with you and your audience. So, thank you for always inviting us. Yeah, yeah. So, Absolutely. um, before you go, yeah, 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 yeah. So, before we go, I remember we have to talk about so GAC, um, GAC Global Agile Chain Makers. Um, yeah, so. That, that's a program we are trying to work on um, um, for kids. We believe that we have come to a place where the world is now interconnected, right? And, um, and so we, our kids need the first-hand experience of global citizenship. Right? We don't need to, one thing you discover about our speakers here is that they are coming to talk practicals. They are not just sharing theories. Right? These things have happened and they are still happening. You know, um, I remember at the point we were talking about connecting students from Nigeria and from the USA, bringing them together in a single space, of course, and allowing them to explore and solve problems together. You know, um, that's one thing that, that's one project that um, we we hope to jump on again, probably after this conference, and again, get it started, because we know that every child anywhere in the world is a global citizen, and there are many opportunities that are bounced globally. So we cannot just lock them within an economy. When there is a global mm -hmm. economy that they can be plugged into with with millions of opportunities for them right and that is why and that is why k-12 right now has to we need global k-12 k-12 has to be resigned for that designed for that experience where kids are offered real-time global decision experience your kids in your school can connect with kids from other places and have learning together and brainstorm together and collaborate you know share ideas together that's what we're talking about that's what k-12 should look at right now and that's what we're doing so um if you're listening to this conference you hear more about um about gac you know um afterwards and you know we can do some great things together with the kids even in your school too all right so once again ladies thank you this duo is always amazing <laughs> thank you jessica thank you rosalie thank you for sharing with us this is so thank good you. yeah thank you ladies you're the best you too yeah. thank you yeah thank you so much Okay, so to all of our viewers out there, um, thank you for staying with us. Um, we are going to be moving into the last session um, just in a moment. Uh, so I have uh, I have Miss Evelyn here in the studio. Uh, yes, and I'm I'm going to be bringing her up, and then we are going to move into the last session for today. Um, this is a moment for you to think about what has been happening here. We've had two sessions, Kai talking about how to um, design learning experiences that can produce real innovators and problem solvers. And we've looked at how to build agile classrooms, right? I believe this is leading you to note, to, to, to build up a, a action points. I believe you're already thinking of new things you can start doing right in your classroom, right? To build and have a K-12 system um, that matches the current and emerging realities surely for the year 2030 right that we are moving to that we're getting close to all right so we're going to jump into the talk session right now yeah hi miss evelyn can you hear me hello hello i can absolutely hear you can you hear me very well very well super i love the energy <laughs> always ready to rock <laughs> yeah awesome awesome yeah so um for all of our viewers out there um um yes miss evelyn she's she's the uh, um the the ceo of um thrive international academy and that is based in georgia and um thrive international academy is all about personalized learning now one of the future of um a k-12 system that is for the future is personalized learning the future oriented K-12 system has to be a K-12 that is all about personalized learning. And here is a school that we have seen 
that is doing personalized learning raw, right? So Mr. Evans is going to take us on a journey on what um, personalized learning looks looks like at um, at Tribe International Academy and how um, they are making it happen for kids to have great learning experiences and you know and how they are really helping kids to meet their academic needs in a unique way um, with the with the personalized learning um, perspective. So once again, Miss Evelyn, you're welcome. Thank yeah. you so much. All right, Thanks hello everyone. Us. Yeah, yeah. So um, quick one. Um, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna allow you to take the floor. Um, I'm gonna ask a number of questions, and then also I'd like to talk about your book. I know you just launched the book. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Awakened Teacher. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We're gonna talk about the book too. Pick one. But then I'm gonna start by asking my first question. And um, my first question is, um, um, what led to the vision of um, um, I, I know it used to be um, Miss Evelyn International Academy, and now we strive International Academy. So what led to the vision of your school? Tell us about it. Absolutely. So hey guys, I am Evelyn Shaw Corley, and. I actually taught in public schools in America in a variety of schools for many, many years, for about 12 years, and I had an experience that changed my life. When I was teaching in an eighth grade classroom, and it was in a very low income area, so many of my students were reading on a second and third grade level in the eighth grade classroom. And there were 30 plus students in this classroom. And I just thought, wow, this is tragic. This is absolutely tragic. And I knew at that point that I needed to dive in and I needed to do something. And so I knew at that point, Adebayo, I knew that when I work with a student one to one, we are able to move mountains. We are able to make miracles when I have that one-to-one -one time with a student. And I would discover that in my classroom. So in 2019, actually, I had this awakening and I realized that I needed to be tutoring. I needed to step away from the traditional system and I needed to start tutoring. And so that is what I did in 2019. So I started working with students one-to-one -one, and even before it was a thing, like even before 2020 came, I was teaching students online. And one day I discovered that my schedule was so busy that I started hiring independent contractors, not only in the state of Georgia, but through the power of the interconnected world, which has so much to do with our 2030 education through the interconnectedness of the world, I started hiring teachers throughout the world. So learning mathematics from Nigeria, <laughs> learning Japanese from a teacher in Japan. The vision came when my students in eighth grade were reading on a second and third grade level. And so it grew and it grew but that is a little bit of how I came to be where I am. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, so right now, I know that there are there are kids who are fully attending Tribe International Academy, right? That's their school. Um, so beyond the story and experience, that's their school. Can you tell us what it looks like right now for all of these kids? Absolutely. Is it okay if I share my screen? Sure, sure. Okay, wonderful. So I am just going to share. Do, do, do. Go to my tab. All right. So let me know. It might take just a minute. Um, let me know when you guys can see my screen. Okay. Yes, we can see right now. All right, wonderful. Yeah. So this is Thrive International Academy. And we came to be in 2019. We were founded on the belief that no matter where you are in the world, education should be accessible to you. And it should be affordable education that is accessible to you. 
And when I first met Adebayo, we were both talking about how, wow, if we use the power of technology and if every student has a smart device, every student in the world can not only receive a remarkable education, but every student can receive what I believe to be what they need, which is mindful mentoring, a champion that sees them, hears them, values them endlessly and limitlessly. That is so important to me. So we'll dive into this in just a little bit. I have a little presentation prepared, but one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is the crisis, not only for our students, but the crisis in education with our teachers. Um, I'll talk more about this book, but I really want you to know that I work with teachers every day and talk to teachers every day who are devastated in the private and public and charter school system. They're overworked. They're overwhelmed. They need the breaks. They have so much pressure. And I have teachers, not only in America, but teachers across the globe coming to me for something different. So I wrote a book that I'll talk to you about in just a little bit. So um, Autobio and I love to talk about Thrive. Students are at the heart of everything we do and everything is customized. Everything is adaptable and everything we do is one to one, which I think, in my opinion, is the future of education, the future of really diving in deep and getting to know the absolute nuances of your very being when you are growing up. Think about the magic. Think about the power of having a mentor who holds space for you every single day. And if you attend our academy, then you automatically have a mindful mentor. So I'll go through what we offer. Um, we are a private academy full-time or just with the classes that you need. We started with tutoring, everybody has mentoring, we do test prep, we do advocacy, and we do career planning and college advisement if that is your path. Um, this is one of our families, and part of what I'm going to talk to you about today is mental health. And this is one of our moms, her name is Meg, and she, as a student, was devastated to the point of depression. And that is what I'm really going to dive into deep with you today is the mental health of our students and the mental health of our adults as well. So Meg came to us as someone who struggled in school herself, and she found a place of compassion, a place that could assist so many families in America and throughout the world are homeschooling. So she came to us feeling faith, feeling trust, and feeling supported, and knowing that her sons needed something different. So um, I am going to share just a couple more things on the website before I go into my presentation. Check to see that you guys can see it. So this is our team, and you'll note that we are Hey, Autobio, <laughs> you'll notice that we are super loving, super compassionate, happy people. We are very, very diverse and we are located all across the globe, all across the globe. So I'm super excited about that. And then the only other thing that I wanted to show you on the website before I dive into my presentation is if you're seeking something different for your learner, I am going to talk about mental health today. So many of our students in 2022, and I think this is something that is going to continue on for a while until we dive in deep, until we dive into the mental health crisis with our students. So at Thrive Academy, who thrives here? 
it's the students who don't fit into a classroom of 18 to 35 students. Do you have depression, anxiety, mood disorders, autism? Does your family travel and you want to do world schooling? Do you have a special need? Are you super, super gifted and not receiving the learning that you need? Do you have dyslexia? Do you have ADHD? Those are all of the things that a lot of our students have, and they are supported, loved, empowered, and so much more. So I am going to, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a minute, and it's going to be just me for a minute. What I want to talk to you about next is a little bit of my crisis in public schools. I started teaching in 2005 and I had stars in my eyes. I was so excited. I just knew that this was going to be the best thing ever. And I wound up just being inundated with a system that broke me, with a system that broke me. And no matter where I went, I was just inundated with stressors. So I wrote this book called The Awakened Teacher, Bold Truths and Bold Beauty. And um, if you are a teacher who is feeling lost, who is feeling overwhelmed, overworked, and under-supported, this book is a safe space for you. It tells the realities of true experiences that happen in American public schools and across the globe. So I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to take you to a little presentation that I have for you guys today. So we can get to know each other and we can also get to know, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. going to 2030 education, share. Let me make sure that you guys can see my screen. Okay. Do, do, do. All right. Thank you for your patience. All right. Awesome. So I'm just going to hit present or slideshow and make sure that you can see it. So again, thank you so much for having me and let's dive in. So 2030 education, what do I see? Where are we going? What are our needs? A little backstory. Um, I am Evelyn Shaw Corley. I'm a wife. I'm a long-term educator, and I'm an advocate for neurodiversity, meaning if your mind works a little bit differently, I am a supporter and I am an advocate for you. I've been an entrepreneur since 2019, and I'm a huge dreamer huge visionary, author, nonprofit founder, and world changer. I graduated from the University of Georgia, taught in public schools for a long, long time. Formerly, Evelyn Educates, like Autobio was talking about, um, but I'm now the CEO of Thrive International Academy. I built it. I'm working on a nonprofit called Beautiful Minds that supports students with neurodiversity, specifically focusing on dyslexia, mood disorders, and ADHD. Um, yes. So let me see. There is a crisis in the American education system. And my belief is, what if every student in the world had a one-to-one -one customized, personalized, engaging experience with a teacher mentor. I am all about the emotional components and seeing, hearing, and supporting our kids, tweens and teens. Mindfulness mentoring is the answer for me, guys. I believe that society needs to develop a whole army of wise mentors to deal with stress, to deal with confusion, to deal with conflict in society. Parents want to be parents, right? Parents don't necessarily want to be the teacher. Parents don't necessarily have that mentoring skill 
to handle what's going on with their children. And sometimes um, you just need that safe person. And I didn't always find that with my bosses. Some of my bosses were amazing. Some of my bosses, not so much, and that's okay. Um, but to have somebody who holds space for you, who is that mindfulness mentor is so important. So let's talk Thrive for just a minute. Founded on the belief that education should be accessible to any student. And Autobio and I feel super strongly about that. Any level, whether you are reaching the moon and stars with giftedness or whether you are a special needs learner needing additional support, you are beautifully made. You are wonderfully made. And there is a place for you here. We honor all humans, all faiths, all backgrounds the voices of the unheard, the voices of the loud and proud, there is a place for you here. So how does Thrive International Academy do it? Um, I've got a little video for you um, that is popping up. So um, this is a little video clip. I'm going to play it. I hope that the volume works. And if it does, we will enjoy. So here's a little video clip for you guys. Hi, I'm Evelyn Shaw Corley, the changemaker and visionary of international education. Thrive Academy was founded on the belief that education should be accessible to any student at any level in any location. Both our students and staff engage in innovative, interconnected, and immersive educational experiences across the globe. And with the emergence of virtual reality, we continue to dive into new spaces every day. Want to learn Japanese from the sweetest woman in Japan? Want to learn from ladies in STEM? Yes, to building relationships through global connections. Yes, to unconditional love and individualized education. We believe every student deserves to be seen, heard, and valued. Join us at Thrive, where we are actively changing the face of education. Yay! I'm so excited. I hope you guys loved that. So Hi, much. I'm Evelyn, Evelyn Shaw Court, and I'm going to act out of that. <laughs> um, so I did close out of my presentation. I wanted to leave you with a few things today. Um, and because I closed out of my presentation, I'm just going to tell you some ways that you can contact me. Um, we still have the EvelynEducates.org website. We're undergoing our big branding change to Thrive International Academy. Reach out to Adebayo if what I'm doing speaks to you. We do serve students around the globe. Our teachers are around the globe. Um, the biggest things that I want to leave you with today before I hop off is that Mindfulness mentoring and one-to-one -one education is changing the way the world works. Jobs are not the same as what they were. We have some awareness of where jobs are going, but in so many ways we don't. And like some of the other presenters before were saying, our kids can Google everything, right? They can Google it. But if we take the time to really get to know them, to focus on their strengths, to help them with their weaknesses, but to focus on their strengths and to help them know that you are beautifully made, you are wonderfully made, and there is a place in this world for you to where you can thrive and be the best version of yourself that you can be. The world is interconnected more so now than ever before, and that's not going away. One thing I want to share with you is that we need to be the model example for our students in demonstrating what a digital footprint is and understanding that the internet is with us, man. The internet is here and interconnectedness and a global nature in society is here. 
I am a huge fan of virtual reality in education and traveling the world, not only in real life, but taking our students on virtual field trips and interacting. Um, I'm huge into Facebook and Meta. I'm huge into social media and letting my students know that it's wonderful to safely connect with people across the globe. So I grew up in the 80s and in the 90s, and we had pen pals at that point in time. But now students can react in live time with people around the globe. It's absolutely incredible. So um, all of that to say, I am so appreciative of this time with you today. So appreciative for this conference. I hope that Thrive International Academy speaks to you. I hope that we connect. And I'd also love for you to read the Awakened Teacher, Bold Truth and Bold Beauty. Adebayo, I love you so much. Thank you for this opportunity Same here. today. Yeah, thank you so much, Ms. Evelyn. You're always amazing. Thank you, Ms. Evelyn. Um, um, yeah, so um, uh, you, you see what's happening right now. This third session um, is opening um, a new, um, another side of, um, of K-12. Um, we want to have a K-12 system that really focuses on the mental health of, of these kids. All right. Um, we don't want to have a K-12 that is just all about, um, like, it's, it's, it, it's, I, what I see is that the system is more important than the kids. So you see stuff like, um, okay, um, after three months, a term has to end, right? So whether you have, whether as a child, whether you have gone through the whole topics or not, it doesn't concern us. What we care about is that we have three months to cover here. If you cannot fit in, we're leaving you behind. And the funny thing again you see is that in those kind of systems, and um, when a new term is going to start, you still have some kids just randomly pass through and then they find them. So it's just it's just not ideal and it doesn't care about the kids, right? It's more about the system and how the system can continue thriving and really not about the kids and how the kids can thrive. That's not going to be the of the future, right? So the kind of people we have today, just like you see at Tribe International Academy, right? There's no pressure. You know, I, I see, I see, I, I see the, the kids I teach at Tribe International Academy, there's no pressure. We are having conversations and we are discussing about how to move and how to really get the kids to a place where they are able to cover their learning areas and, and everything is fine with them. And, you know, putting their mental health into consideration is a priority. And that's just, their, that's just a standard. That's a standard. Yeah, that's a standard. That's what we're bringing into K-12. We, do, we don't want to have a K-12 system that is just all about the system and not all about the kids. A K-12 that is truly, right. yeah, that is truly kid-centered, that is truly designed and for the kids. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Oh, no. And just throwing in, we don't want to ship them in and ship them out. We want to get to know them as the beautiful individuals that they are. As the beautiful individuals. You know, it's just so painful that we have a case that is that is anti, anti-personalization, right? And that's why at the end of the day, we end up not discovering the uniqueness of these kids. We end up not seeing the their uniqueness, the potentials that they're wired in because the system is designed in such a way that it doesn't ask for it. The system is just all about something. It's about a goal that leaves the kids aside. It's not really for the kids, right? And that's why their uniqueness, what the kids could discover, what they could bring, innovations that could come out of the kids are ignored because the system is in a run and the system doesn't really care about it. But we know that that will not happen in the future. Any school that is doing that in the future will be left behind. Will be left behind. Because we're going to have schools like Tribe International Academy and many schools like that who are really saying, hey, parents, we are truly interested in your kids, right? We're not just about, um, no, because parents who are interested in a setting that is truly interested in their kids. Parents want a place where their kids can be safe, a place where their kids can be rightly nurtured and prepared for the society. For the society is going to become more interconnected. It's going to become more complex. That's the reality. And parents to parents to are, are awake. They're, they're, they're looking at it. Is this school really going to give my kids what they need? Right? Because they see the they see the realities unfolding, right? So even even the parents we have to do what they are going to some parents have to work from home. Um, you know, they have to demonstrate some little level of skills and you know, and all that. So our world is changing and um in the future it's not going to reduce, it's going to increase. 
um, it's going to become more complex, um, which is why we are seeing. And because it's going to become more complex, the issue of mental health is going to become very serious because we want to raise kids who are able to manage pressure, kids that can manage stress, that can cope in a complex world, in a world where many things just seem to be happening at the same time, right? We talk about the great resignation. People are leaving their jobs because the way it looks like and all of that. So K-12 needs to take a new shape to really handle what the world has become today. And thank you, Ms. Evelyn, for what you are doing at Tribe International Academy. Thank you for um, a new generation of kids that you are raising to be able to fit into a world that is becoming complex. Thank you for your effort and everything um, that you are doing. And I'm, I'm so glad to be part of the team too and that we're doing together. That's super amazing. Okay. And um, uh, and this is a good place for us to uh, for us to end um, for us to end the conference for today. It has been a great journey, um, I must say. Um, so thank you once again, Miss Evelyn. Thank you for your time. Oh, thank you for sharing all of this. You, yeah. you want to say one more thing? Oh, just what an honor it was today. And I so appreciate this opportunity and every single moment that I have with you and in this space. Thank you. Yes, Miss Evelyn, you are the best. <laughs> so good to have you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it has been a great journey today with um with the three sessions we've had from Kyle how to design learning experiences that can produce real innovators and problem solvers to Jessica and Rosalie, how to build agile classrooms. You saw those demonstrations. And then to Miss Hevelin, uh, talking about how to personalize learning, right? How to really have a system that is truly interested in every child. We don't have that system today. It's, we have fear of such systems globally. We have fear of such systems that is truly interested in every child. We don't have that. We just have a system that is interested in a goal that leaves the kids aside. All of this is pointing to what K-12 should look like for the world in the year 2030. And that's what we're discussing about right here. For everyone that has stayed so far, thank you for your time. Um, we're excited that you are here and that you're joining us. We hope that these three sessions have informed you, have inspired you greatly um, to try out new things, right? Um, to sit down and craft a new model right for your k-12 institution right there so that you can say that you are part of the, 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 the you're part of the um the workforce that is raising kids who will thrive in a complex in a volatile and uncertain and you know, in an ambiguous future right so thank you so much for your time um thank you for joining us we are so glad to have you this conference continues tomorrow where we're going to be having prio from finland uh where she's going to be taking us uh uh, on another mental flight, um, still on this subject. And then we have uh, um, Miss Adebimpe from um, Pearl's Garden School. And then we're going to have Kainaja, right? You don't want to miss tomorrow's session, right? Kainaja is a young boy, 15 years old, who owns a company. Last we were discussing yesterday, we was talking to him about a pitch he was going to prepare for, um, you know, to do some things. And, you know, K-12 is now producing amazing kids, right? And Kainaja is a model of such things, right? So much abounds in tomorrow's session. Uh, please do all to join us by 11 a.m. Uh, Nigerian time, West African Standard Time um, in tomorrow's session. Once again, my name is Adebayo. I'm the head of research and chief learning designer at EZDG. EZDG is a research and training-based organization in educational technology and 21st century learning system. Right? We work with schools to build blended learning system based on global standards. We believe in the power of collaboration and that's why you see us working with these people, right? You see Kyle, you see uh, uh, Jessica and Rosalind. We believe in the power of collaboration. The problems we have today are global, and we need a global system. We need a global team. We need, we need collaboration to really solve these problems, right? We can't solve these problems in isolation. And that's why we need to pull force together, right? We believe so much in global collaboration. And to say global collaboration, right? It's a global village, and there's a group, there has to be a global perspective for everything we're doing. There's a global side to this. As I, as I, as I end of this session, I'd like to leave you with this word, right? Every child in your school is a global citizen, and you need to prepare them for global relevance, global collaboration, and global competition. I'd like to leave you with that word. Think about that. And we look forward again to receiving you tomorrow by 11 a.m. Goodbye and thank you for your time. See you tomorrow.